very pleased to welcome Pauline Cullen as today's presenter. Pauline has taught in the UK, Spain, Hong Kong and Australia and has been working with Cambridge English since 1995. She's been involved in writing five Cambridge titles, including the official Cambridge Guide to IELTS. Over to you, Pauline. Good morning or good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Um, and it's called How to Improve Your Students' IELTS Score. Before we started, you were asked some poll questions, and they each refer to the four different papers in the IELTS test. So I'll deal with these as we cover each skill. I'm going to begin by talking about your approach to IELTS, both from the learning and the teaching point of view. Then we'll look at each of the four macro skills separately. So that's reading, listening, writing, and speaking. And with each skill, I'll be talking about the skills you need to practice, how to approach test materials with students of bands four and five, and how to exploit those test materials and use them as teaching tools. I'll also be referring to our latest title, the Cambridge Official Guide to IELTS. The book is a very comprehensive guide to the IELTS test, and it's in two separate parts. The first half is a skills section, which outlines and explains the different skills you need to master for the IELTS test. And this is followed by a practice test section with eight practice tests. And my role on this book was writing the skills section. So let's start by asking this question. How do you see the IELTS test? Your attitude to the test can shape the way you prepare for it. In this picture, the student sees the test as an obstacle blocking his path. And the problem with seeing the test that way is that preparation generally involves looking for ways around the obstacle or looking for shortcuts. For example, you might look for patterns or ways to try and guess answers or try to learn writing task answers off by heart to use in the test. Not only will this give you a lower score in the test, but it also wastes valuable learning time. Another problem with this image is that the whole focus is only on the test itself and not on language learning. And that's not desirable either for the language classroom or in terms of making progress in your language learning. Here are some common strategies that people use to try to get a higher score. Students often plan to do lots of practice tests. I know one student whose approach was to keep taking the test over and over. And he was quite disappointed when he kept getting the same score. Teachers who are new to IELTS might decide to prepare their class by giving them practice tests and going over the answers. But as you can see from this next slide, these are all unhelpful strategies when it comes to improving your IELTS score. Looking for patterns or shortcuts and only focusing on tests means that you go around in circles and essentially just stay in the same place. It's much better to see the test like this. In this picture, the IELTS test is a signpost that tells you how far you've come in your language learning. Taking this analogy a little further, you could see IELTS as a sort of GPS. In the test, the students need to give off very clear signals to show where they are. The aim of an IELTS course should be to show students how to give off those signals and also to help improve and develop their language skills so that they can make genuine progress and achieve a better score in the test. So the student I mentioned before who kept taking the test was basically standing still in one spot and asking, where am I, over and over again, which is why he always got the same answer in his test score. Now, if that analogy seems a little too simplistic, here's a more appropriate one. IELTS preparation is more like this, with students not walking along a road, but swimming in a pool. And your students need to learn the skills that will help them stay afloat. This analogy also helps to show that because IELTS measures from band 1 to band 9, students at every level have to cope with the same element and take the same test. So it's inevitable that students at band 4 and 5 will sometimes feel out of their depth, while the higher bands are more confident. But it's important to understand that all levels need to practice and develop the same core skills. Now, I said earlier that you shouldn't only take tests or do practice tests, but test practice is important. It helps to increase familiarity with the test and to improve timing, which is an important part of every paper in the test. 
and both of these together help build confidence. And these are the main reasons to do test practice, not as a language learning tool. Some common questions I've been asked about IELTS are, what if I don't understand a word in the question? And several teachers have asked me, why does IELTS have so many different types of questions? The answer is that the IELTS test is written with some key aims in mind. The first is to be fair. And that means that it's designed to make sure that candidates who are in the lower bands have as much opportunity to show off what they know as the higher band candidates. The answer to the teacher's question is also that IELTS aims to be valid, accurate, and reliable. So what's a valid test of a skill like reading, for example? Well, it's important to realize that referring to just four macro skills is a bit too simplistic. In reality, these are divided up into numerous sub-skills. So a valid reading test score that's accurate and reliable has to measure all of those sub-skills. A valid test also has to take into account the purpose of the test. With the academic module, the test scores are often used as a gateway to university study. So the skills being tested need to reflect those that are relevant to academic study. The different questions also have an impact on the classroom. And you can imagine that a test with a variety of question types that require a range of, of reading subskills will have a much more positive washback effect on the classroom than a test with only multiple choice questions, for example. OK, so let's look at reading skills. What specific reading skills do students need to develop in order to achieve a high score in the test? This was the approach that I took when writing the skills section of the book. It helps if you see each question type as having a clear purpose, which is to force candidates to use specific reading skills. So I worked backwards from the three different sections of the reading test and the 11 different question types. And these are the skills we identified. This is the contents page from the reading skills section of the new book, and I've highlighted the key skills. The reading test gradually becomes more difficult, and we took the same approach with the book. So the units progress from surface level reading skills, such as scanning a passage for a specific detail, and dealing with descriptive passages, which reflects reading section one passages, then on to understanding how ideas are connected to each other, and identifying opinion and attitude in more argumentative or discursive texts, which is what they'll find in reading section three passages. On the screen now is an example from the new book. So this is how we introduce a specific skill. And here it's skimming a passage and speed reading. We explain what it's useful for and then provide practice. And this is basically how each of the different sub-skills is approached in the book. It's really important to start with developing skills like these before you move on to test practice. This trains your students to be more aware of the skills they're using, and so they're more likely to use those skills when they're doing test practice and in the test itself. These skills are really the swimming aids and flotation devices, if you like, that they can call upon throughout the test even with passages where they feel out of their depth. In our poll question at the start, we asked you if you think it's a good idea to read the questions first in the reading test. And most of you, I think, agree with me. No, disagree with me, sorry. In my own view, and what I've always taught students, is that it's best to begin by reading the passage. I think that reading the questions first tempts students into thinking they might be able to guess some of the answers, and they absolutely will not be able to do this. It also tempts them to try and answer questions from their own knowledge or experience. This is the wrong approach because the questions make it very clear that they need to answer according to the information in the passage. Reading first also helps by giving you an overall impression of the passage, which is a real advantage when it comes to dealing with the questions. So my advice is, in your preparation, put skills before tests. And in the test, 
put reading before answering questions. I also think it helps to think about how we test understanding. Basically, a good test will assess whether you can process information rather than simply repeating it or copying it. This quotation from Albert Einstein helps understand that idea of processing information. Einstein said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. So the questions in the reading test are essentially a way of putting the information into other simpler words. So once you've introduced these reading skills and begun developing them, you need to think about how to approach the deeper waters of test practice. So how should you tackle reading test practice materials with lower band students? Well, you need to remember that students at this level are going to need help and support to increase their confidence. Having said that, I wouldn't allow the use of dictionaries until the very end. Students in the lower bands tend to be very dependent on their dictionary. And they also tend to think that they won't do well in the reading test because they don't know enough vocabulary. So it's important to teach your students to use their reading skills to help them cope with a passage without understanding every word. At the start, I compared test materials to getting into deep water. So what I recommend for band four and five candidates is that you control just how quickly you immerse yourself fully in the water and also how deep you initially go by limiting yourself to reading section one materials only until your students are more confident in using the reading skills you are teaching them. You can also guide them through the reading stage with what I've called guided reading and I'll explain that in a moment. After a guided reading of the whole passage, I would then introduce them to the first set of questions and discuss them. I'd go through the task with the class and discuss the skills they will need to use to help find the answers. I've deliberately used the word test here because this is where you're testing those reading skills that you've practiced. I'd repeat that process for each separate task before looking at the answers. Don't focus on time at this stage. Just try to be aware of how long it's taking your class to answer the questions. That can be a good indicator of how well they're coping. In the test, there are three separate passages and 40 questions to answer in a total of 60 minutes. I often advise students to aim for a target of one minute per question, which allows time for pre-reading each passage and checking and transferring their answers at the end. But at the start, I would just make a note of how far away from that target your students are. After completing all of the questions, I would review their answers. And finally, I'd exploit the test practice materials by studying the language. And I'll give you some ideas for how to do both of those in a moment. So here's how all of that works in practice. This slide shows a reading section one passage from the book. Now, with students of band six and over, you could begin by getting them to concentrate on speed reading the whole passage to get the overall meaning. But with lower bands, especially initially, I think it's better to build up a gradual picture by revealing the text paragraph by paragraph, like this. And this is what I mean by guided reading. So this is the title and subheading and the first paragraph of the passage you would ask your students to look at the title and subheading. Here, it's the Dover Bronze Age boat. And at this stage, your band four students are probably itching to open their dictionary to look up words like Dover or Bronze Age. But if you ask them to look at the subheading, you can see the information they need is right there. It says, a beautifully preserved boat made around 3,000 years ago and discovered by chance in a muddy hole has had a profound impact on archaeological research. So if you ask the question, how long ago do you think the Bronze Age was, they should be able to answer 3,000 years ago. Teaching them to trust the test and to build up skills like this is very important. The first sentence of the paragraph helps them to understand the word Dover. From the first sentence, they should be able to work out that, well, it has a capital letter, so it's probably a name. And as a road and a tunnel was being built there, we can deduce that it's a place. And we're also told it's in England. 
So it's really important for students to learn how to get that information from the passage. They just need to read. So at this pre-reading stage, we're just focusing on the overall message, not a detailed reading of the text. The detailed reading is what they do when they answer the questions. So to help us focus on that overall message, you might ask them to label each passage, each paragraph rather, and decide what the purpose of it is. For example, is it A, introducing a new idea, B, giving background information, C, explaining something, and so on. These are just a few ideas I came up with, but you might produce some of your own for different passages. As this is the first paragraph, not surprisingly, we might choose A, but we can also choose B for this one. And I think it's good to show them that a paragraph might be performing more than one function. At the end of the whole passage, you could discuss with them what it was all about. And remember that quote from Albert Einstein, the aim here is to explain what they've read in simpler language so that they're processing the information and showing understanding. OK, so by now your students should be ready to look at the first task. And here it's a flowchart completion. I would spend some time discussing the task so that it's less daunting. We talked earlier about test fairness, and this is where that comes into play. For example, question order. Because the candidates only have a limited time to answer the questions, the questions are designed to be as helpful as possible. There aren't any tricks. Some of you may be a little bit confused about question order because there are times when the questions are not in the same order as the text. But there is a clear logic to this, and if you have a look at the box on the right, I'll explain it. Basically, the questions are always in the same order as the text for the following types of questions. So, multiple choice, short answer questions, Sentence completion where you have to write in a missing word or words from the passage. And identifying information, which is also known as true, false, not given, or yes, no, not given. So these types of question all direct or send the candidates to a specific part of the text and ask them to read it in detail. And they always come in text order. Now, the questions are never in text order for any of the matching questions. And this is where students are being tested on their ability to go and find the information in the text. The task here is to locate it. So these logically can't be simply in text order. And for the last type of questions, the information is sometimes in the same order as the text, and sometimes it isn't. And that includes notes completion, summary completion, and so on, diagram completion, and so on. Now, that's because these are all ways of taking the information in the text and presenting it in a different way, in a different format, if you like. If we look at the task here, it's a flowchart completion. The information in the flowchart is clearly organized according to the date, but in the text, the information may not be described in chronological order. So the flowchart rearranges it. So looking at this task, when you're discussing this with the class, you should point out all the helpful information in the question. This task is asking them to look for key events, and the dates in the flowchart provide markers that they can scan the text for to help them do this. Again, it's good to teach them that the task itself will guide them through. Then point out how many words they need to write. This is very important, and they must stick to this word limit. Let's look at the first question here in detail to see the different reading skills this task requires and to get some idea of that washback effect I talked about earlier. Okay, so if you look at this slide, you can see the part of the text that relates to this first question. The question says, in 1992, the boat was discovered during the construction of a blank. So we need to find something that was being constructed when the boat was found in 1992. Now if we look over at the text, I've highlighted in yellow the information they would initially scan the text for. And here it's the year 1992, something being constructed, and a mention of the boat. 
So the boat is first mentioned down in the second paragraph where we read they had found a prehistoric boat. So now we need to use our reading skills to understand the reference to they, which is the workmen mentioned in the first sentence at the beginning. Then we need to see what was being constructed at that time. And there are three possible things that could fit into this sentence, into this gap. And I've marked those in green. It could be a new road, a port, or a tunnel. And if we process this information, then we realize that they were building or constructing a new road. So the answer we need to write in is road. Now, at the review stage, it's important to point out to your students that if they write at road or new road, then their answer is incorrect. The task asks for one word only and has and at is already written in the flowchart. Lower bands tend to struggle to pinpoint the exact information they need, and asking for a specific number of words helps to determine their reading level. So you can see there are several different skills required here. Scanning for information, understanding referencing, detailed reading, and understanding paraphrase. And I think it's good to make it clear to your class that they aren't simply answering questions. Instead, the focus should be on the skills they're being tested on. Now let's look at the review stage. And again, it's important to focus on skills rather than on answers being right or wrong. In this slide, I've tried to suggest a way to do that. First of all, I'd ask students to rate their own confidence level in their answers. For each question, they can assign it a number from 1, I had to guess, to 5, I'm sure I'm right. Once you've checked their answers and gone over any problems, you can then use this information to help identify any weak areas they have. For example, did they feel most confident about answering short answer questions? Or did they mostly guess the identifying information questions? You can then work back from there to target the skills they need for this type of question and make the students aware of these. I'd suggest that if they're guessing a large number of Section 1 questions, then they're not ready to move on to Section 2 level reading passages. OK. As I said earlier, test practice materials can be great teaching resources, and they can be exploited in several different ways. This can be done either after the test practice or at a later date. Or with a class that's a very low level, you could do this before the test practice. Just don't be afraid to revisit materials. Exploiting the materials this way can also train your students to notice the way that ideas are connected and can have a positive washback effect on their own writing. For example, here I've focused on the vocabulary in the first paragraph. It's often best to do this just for just a section of, of the text at a time to make it more effective because Overloading lower level students can interfere with the amount of information they're able to take in. I also find that doing exercises like this helps to jog the student's memory at a later stage. So if uh, they are asking what the word archaeology means a few weeks later, you can say something like, do you remember when we looked at the vocabulary in the Dover boat passage? And associating words with a specific context or activity can really help in recalling them. You could also focus on things like referencing in the text, as I've done here in this slide. You could ask questions like, what does which refer back to? And again, this can help with both their reading and their own writing, uh, their own writing skills. Here, I've focused on aspects of grammar. And here on synonyms. Synonyms are really important because paraphrase and synonyms are how we use different words to explain the same idea, and they're crucial to how we demonstrate understanding. So now let's move on to look at listening skills. So what skills should you practice? Well, again, these are the skills I identified from the different tasks and questions in the test, and I used these as the framework for each of the units in the listening skills section of the book. Again, you can see that we begin with simpler skills like identifying and writing numbers and move on to more complex skills such as identifying attitudes and opinions. So these are the skills that your students will be tested on and that they need to develop, practice and master to do well in the test itself. 
Again, it's important to keep the focus on skills rather than on simply answering questions. In the official guide, I tried to do this by focusing on the language being used to convey different types of information. This example here focuses on the language used to describe a place or a location. And I've tried to show how this would work in any of the four different sections of the test to show how the language level progresses through the test. So the first extract is from section one, then section two, three, and finally section four. In this example, the focus is on sections one and three only, where the students have to follow a conversation. This is quite a different skill to following a talk, and it's important to focus on what's involved in doing that and give plenty of practice. In the listening test, it's really important to teach your students to actively listen. It isn't a passive activity. And it's a good idea to include some techniques to train your students how to do this. Here are some things I found helpful in the past. Firstly, for this type of activity, it's best to limit yourself to quite short extracts. This helps you to work on or develop recall. And some of the activities you can then do are to listen and repeat. This helps with focus and helps students to pay close attention to what they're listening to. You can then move on to asking them to listen and then explain, which helps to test their understanding. And finally, they could listen and write what they hear, which helps with focus and taking notes. So these are just some ideas to help improve active listening. OK, so how should you approach test practice? Well, with band four or five students, I would only tackle, listens, tackle sections one and two at the start to build up their confidence and to help establish and develop their listening skills. But unlike the reading test, you should begin by studying the questions. In the test, the candidates are given time to do this, and it's important for students to learn how to make the most of this time. Studying the questions is not about trying to answer them before they listen, though, and you really must stress that. It helps them to get ready to listen and to predict the topic. This is really important, as they only get to listen once to each part of the test. Once you've done that, I would then let them listen and complete the task. This could be done task by task to break it up for classes at the lower level. After you've completed all the tasks, I would then review the answers. And finally, I'd exploit the materials by using the tape script to study the language. So let's look at how this would all work. This is a listening section three task from the book. And as we said, the first approach should be to study the questions. And it's a good idea to get them to underline the important information they need to be listening for. Talking again just for a moment about test fairness, the listening test questions guide the candidates through the listening. So the questions will always follow the same order as the information in the recording. This is very important as the recording is only heard once. There is no need to listen again or to backtrack. Here I've highlighted the key words in the questions to show how the questions help and how you can use them both to predict the topic and to follow the recording. So looking at this one, we can predict that the speakers will discuss a computer system. They'll talk about a problem with the system. Then they'll talk about a timetabling problem. One of them will suggest a way to solve the problem. The same person will also talk about a new system. And then they'll talk about the existing system. With band four students, I would discuss each task this way before listening so that you're training them to use the questions. You can see that the questions are designed to guide the students through the conversation. The test only comes from being able to process and follow the information in the recording, where, just like with the reading test, different words will be used to those in the questions. So when it comes to reviewing the answers, I would again use this as an opportunity to focus on skills and identify weak areas. So begin by asking the students to rate their confidence level. Then check their answers and discuss any problems. Self-study students can use the tape script to help them do this. And again, use this information to build up a picture of weak areas. 
are your students mainly guessing when it comes to map completion tasks, for example, or when they're asked to select answers from a list of six or seven options? And now to go back to our poll question at the start, we asked if it's important to use the correct spelling in the listening test, and most of you agreed with this one, I'm quite right. Uh, the answer is that yes, spelling is just as important as in any other part of the test. It's important to tell your students that there are no half marks for spelling mistakes, so they need to be as accurate as possible. Now, the listening test practice materials can also be exploited in several different ways. And you can do this by using the tape script of the back of the book to help you focus on language. This first slide shows part of the tape script for a Section 3 exercise. With band four or five students, you can ask them to listen, and then as they listen, highlight the words and phrases where they think the speakers are making a suggestion or negotiating. This slide shows what band six or higher students could be asked to do at the same time if you have a mixed ability class. So here the teacher might type out a section of the script and blank out the same type of language that you want your band four students to identify. And you can also exploit the listening resources to help with other skills. For example, speaking. Students could listen to a section two or section four talk and make their own notes. They could then use these notes to give the talk themselves. I'd stick to section two and to short sections of the talk with bands four and five. You could do something similar with sections one and three, but ask pairs of students to role play a part of the conversation. Another idea is to use the tape script to focus on pronunciation. You can ask your students to listen to the recording, and as they listen to mark or pay attention to different aspects of pronunciation, such as intonation, stress, and chunking. And by chunking, I mean the way that we naturally join words together as we speak, rather than talking in a robotic way. I think this is especially useful for self-study students, as they may not have a teacher to help correct or model these things. So the recordings can become their model. You can even exploit the listening task for writing. With a diagram completion task, they could listen to make a, key, a note of key vocabulary and then try to produce a written description of the diagram. So there's lots of things you can do to exploit listening test practice materials. OK, so we've dealt with the passive skills of listening and reading. Now let's look at the active skills, where your students have to produce language rather than simply react to the language they're presented with. So first, writing skills. And again, here are the skills we identified in the writing section of the test. Some of these are based on the specific writing tasks that the students need to complete such as comparing and contrasting data, describing a map, or planning an essay. Other skills were identified by referring to the criteria used to assess the writing test. So for example, linking ideas, avoiding repetition, developing your ideas clearly, and so on. At the lower levels, it's important to begin with controlled practice, but this usually limits the practice to vocabulary and grammar. Free practice is also necessary, and that's when the gaps in their knowledge become apparent and when they practice writing coherently and at length. And the new book shows you ways to work on these areas. Until your students are ready to take on a whole essay question, it's a good idea to begin by focusing on individual paragraphs. And we've given help with that in units 6, 7, and 8, where the students are gradually guided through the writing of a complete essay. But once your students are ready for a greater level of free practice, this is what I would do. First, I would teach the language areas they need for that particular writing task. These are different for writing task two, for, uh, two and for writing task one. Although writing task one can look very complex, the fact that the students are being asked to describe a visual information that's given to them, this means that there is an element of control and it also means you can focus on quite specific targeted language that they will need to use. So this is a good place to start. Next, look at the question with them and discuss what the task is. 
I then focus on their ideas because this can be the first stumbling block for many students. So it's a good idea to get them to discuss their ideas together in groups or as a class rather than starting to write immediately. The next stage is to do some language preparation. It might be a list of words that you would like them to use and practice. It could be language structures that will help them to organize their ideas. You might decide to only focus on one of these at any one time. And you could even revisit the same writing task with a different focus each time, improving their answer in separate stages. And next, I'd ask the students to actually write their responses to the question. I wouldn't focus on time initially. It's more important to build up the framework and skills for approaching the task. The time element can come later. And the final stage I'd recommend is review. And I'll talk some more about that in a moment. So here's an example from the book of how we approached language study. And the exercises here look at different ways to improve your lexical resource score by avoiding repetition. So that's in the way that you use vocabulary. It's a great idea to get students thinking critically about their own writing so that they can try to be aware of their own weaknesses. Let's just take a look at two writing task questions from the book and how you might discuss them with your class. I'll just give you a few seconds to look at them. I imagine that your attention went straight to these areas here and here. But with your students, you need to stress that their main task is here in these highlighted areas. So that's here and here and then below. These are the elements they must focus on if they want to score well in the test. In our poll question at the start, we asked if you thought students should write as much as possible in the writing test. And most of you said, no, this was not true. And that's the right answer. The answer is no, they should stick to the minimum word limit that they're given and not write very much more than that. If their answer is a lot longer, then the likelihood is that their ideas will be repetitive. There will likely be problems with coherence and organization and their answer will probably contain more basic errors. If they write too short an answer, they will be penalized and will re receive a lower score. Writing task one, if they're distracted by the statistics that are, you can see here and immediately launch into describing them, then they will neglect to summarize the information and may not select the main features and make comparisons. This is crucial to scoring well in the criteria referred to as task response. Similarly, for the writing task two question here, if students immediately start to write about people who work for one company all of their lives, they're likely to neglect to discuss both views, give their own opinion, or give reasons for their answer, and include relevant examples. If we look at an extract from the task response descriptors, you can see that candidates at band four don't cover key features in their answer. They may also include details that are irrelevant, inaccurate, or they may repeat ideas. For writing task two, they only answer in a minimal way, and again their ideas may go off on a tangent or may not be relevant to the task. So this shows that they are not answering those particularly highlighted areas in the question. We're also told that writing, for writing task two, they often don't support their ideas with relevant examples or give reasons for their answer. So these are clear areas you can see you need to focus on. As with the previous skills, review is very important if students are going to progress. Students can sometimes be reluctant to review their written work, which is perhaps why they often repeat the same mistakes. And in this slide, I've taken an extract from some writing task responses from the Cambridge Corpus. The first is an example from a band four candidate, and the second is from a band six candidate. As you can see, they both make the same error. The band four candidate has used one plural noun correctly, computers, but then incorrectly uses the singular of bank and supermarket. 
the band six candidate correctly uses the plural for computers, students, and studies, but then at the end of the sentence incorrectly uses the singular computer. So what we call basic errors can occur even at band six. Of course, there are other issues of the band four response that make it a band four, such as spelling, coherence, punctuation, and so on. But basic errors like this could interfere with a band six candidate who wants to achieve a band six, seven, especially if these errors are more than just a slip and unnoticeable throughout their writing. The only real way to combat this is to review and deliberately practice weak areas or mistakes that are being repeatedly made. So finally, let's look at ways to exploit the writing test materials. You can use the reading texts as models to show you how ideas are organized and linked together, and to show you how to use referencing and supporting evidence. You can use the listening resources, as we've already seen, by writing a description of the diagrams. And you can use the ideas in the writing task two questions to practice for your speaking part, speaking part three by discussing the ideas first. So finally, let's look at speaking skills. And these are the specific skill areas we identified for the speaking test. Again, these are based on the three different parts of the test as well as the different assessment criteria. So there's talking about familiar topics from part one, giving a talk from part two, and talking about more abstract topics from part three as well as a focus on accuracy, fluency, coherence, pronunciation, and so on. I think it's been quite difficult for teachers and for self-study students to get a clear idea of how the speaking test works because, uh, and how it's assessed, rather. So we're really excited with the official guide because for the first time we've included videos of authentic speaking tests. And on the screen now is a still from the DVD. We videoed four different tests using the same test materials, but with candidates of different nationalities and different levels, from band four to band seven. What we've tried to do is show both how the test works and how it's assessed. And there are ex exercises for you in the book to help you work through the videos and to focus on different aspects of the candidate's performance. So for example, here the focus is on part two and the ways the candidates manage to keep talking for two minutes. For students, the speaking test can seem like the more personal and therefore the most daunting part of the test. It's where they feel they're performing and so they may feel anxious and hopefully watching the videos will take away a lot of that sense of anxiety. Now in our poll questions, we asked if you felt that band four candidates wouldn't understand a lot of the speaking test questions. A few of you were unsure about the answer to this, but the answer is that no, they shouldn't feel that they don't understand many of the questions because the examiners are trained to adapt their questions to the level of each candidate, while also giving them plenty of opportunities to show off their language skills. And in the video, you can see how the different candidates deal with the questions, and you can also see how the examiner adapts the questions so that each candidate receives a fair test. To illustrate this idea of fairness, here's a question the examiner in the video asks in part one of the speaking test, which covers talking about familiar topics. Now you can see that the question is phrased in a way to help the candidate. First, a change in topic is clearly signaled when he says, now let's talk about writing. And he then asks the question, what different types of writing do you do? For example, letters, emails, reports, or essays. So the candidates know exactly what they're being asked to talk about. The test is on the language that they produce in response. So how should you, how should you handle speaking test practice? Well, I think it's easier to handle test practice for the speaking test than for other parts of the test in many ways. That's because the student's own level sets the pace and controls it. The important thing is to make them feel very much at home with the different parts of the test. Test familiarity means they can relax just that little bit more, so role-playing test situations is very important. They can take turns being examiner and candidate. And recording their performance is also very important so that you can review their language. And if you can use video, their body language as well. 
One piece of feedback that I don't think is very helpful for students is in telling them that they need to be more confident. Some people are naturally shy, so this isn't something they can easily change. I think it's more helpful to tell them to aim to be friendly in their approach to the examiner in the speaking test. That can help them to engage with the examiner and so contribute more. After reviewing your recording, you can work on any weak areas that you identify. Now, I would then get to the, them to repeat the same exercise and record themselves again, so students get a sense of making progress. Now, review isn't easy for self-study students, particularly when it comes to fluency and coherence, I think. One good way to approach this is by writing out the script of your own recording, including any pauses and so on. So here are extracts from the responses of two of the candidates on our video. One is a band five and one a band seven. And you can see here the descriptor for band five says, usually maintains flow of speech, but uses repetition, self-correction, and or slow speech to keep going. And this is what the band five candidate says. And if you can see just by looking at the script, there are very clear signs of that repetition. The word prefer, prefer, prefer comes up over and over again. And there is very obvious hesitation with mm, uh, and so on being repeated often. With the band seven, we're told they can speak at length without noticeable effort or loss of coherence. And the band seven candidate in the video has this in response to a question. And you can see there is a, a lot less repetition and less hesitation. And they're able to talk with greater ease, as the descriptor says. So writing your own script out in this way can be a good way of making fluency and coherence more obvious to your students. And it's also a good way of measuring progress in this area if you repeat the same uh, recording at a later date. In terms of review and deliberate practice for the speaking test, here are some key aspects you need to focus on. So pronunciation, and that includes individual sounds, word stress, sentence stress, intonation, and the chunking that we referred to earlier. In terms of grammar and vocabulary, it's a good idea to see if there is a link to the same mistakes being made in their writing. You could also encourage them to actively use the vocabulary that they're learning in class. With fluency and coherence, again, it's a good idea to record yourself, but also to practice often, and again, check if there is a link to the coherence problems in their writing. OK, so that's all of the skills covered. So I'll finish by summarizing the tips for preparing for the test. So our helpful strategies are to have the right attitude, to trust the test, to study language skills, and to do practice tests. Also to review your answers, identify weak skill areas, deliberately practice, and exploit test materials. The most important points there, I think, are to identify weak skill areas and to deliberately practice. And on the day of the test, I think that you should aim to be prepared, relaxed, focused, and friendly. And finally, I think it's really important to get your students reading widely outside of the classroom. And this helps to develop their skills and also gives them ideas to talk about in their writing and speaking test. And I recommend articles that are freely available through my Twitter and Facebook accounts and in a, week, in a magazine that I have on Flipboard called IELTS Weekly. OK, thanks, everyone, for listening. And I hope you found the information useful and enjoy the new book. I'd really like to thank Alistair Horn for all his help and um, putting this webinar together and making it look so smooth and professional. <laughs> and now I'll hand back over to Alistair. OK, thanks. Thanks very much, Pauline. Now, we've got a, a lot of questions have come in already. People really engaged by that, really interested. So the first question I'll ask, one of the early ones we had, um, which is um, from, from Lawrence Goldman, who's very interested in skimming and scanning and wondered whether you had any advice on where to find um, 
advice on, on teaching skimming and scanning um, beyond the, uh, the official guide? Um, we also have other texts that we've written in the past. Uh, two of my texts are focus on read on vocabulary, and in the advanced uh, vocab for IELTS, at the back of the book there are four units devoted to building skills, and one of those specifically works on reading skills. So I think that's a good uh, place to start. <laughs> uh, but I will look out for some other texts, and maybe I can uh, recommend some if I find some good ones for that. That. Okay, thank you. Got a question from Romani Jenkins who says, How can we help students to deal with fatigue during listening? Um, I've had students say they switch off halfway through. I, I think that's an important point and the points I raised about getting the trainer to actively listen for short bursts of time is a good one but it's also it's something that we do specifically think about in the writing of the questions so use the questions as a signpost to help them to concentrate and to stay focused. Um, that's a really important thing that they can do. If they lose track, they should always be focusing down on those questions and on the question paper. Um, I used to invigilate listening tests uh, for other exams, other Cambridge exams, and I was often struck by how many candidates would sit there staring at the ceiling rather than at the question paper. Um, it doesn't help to focus, I think, if you're staring around at the ceiling. If they focus all their attention on the question paper, they won't become distracted or their mind won't start to wander. So the question paper is always where their focus should be. Okay, thank you. A question now for, from Salud D'Souza. Um, so, says, Pauline, uh, it's been suggested that doing a sort of division of labour in a training session with one expert on um, listening, one on speaking, another for reading, and another for writing. Um, do you find that works in a, in a training session? That's, that's an interesting point. And um, I recently, or last year rather, I was in China and realised that uh, many of the schools there um, use a technique where they will have one teacher who focuses on writing and another on listening and so on. Um, I think it, it, you miss an opportunity if you do that because the, there is overlap with skills. As I said in, in some of the points I made, for example, there is a link to writing mistakes and speaking mistakes. And so uh, while on the one hand you can really hone in on one skill, I think that for me I would prefer to be looking at several different skills. Um, and that can also mean that you're getting a, a more interesting lesson in a way because you can cover different skills within one session, which I think is a bit more interesting. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Um, question now from uh, Hannah, Hannah Krasin, apologies, Hannah, Hannah uh, Krasilnik, who asks, do you have any suggestions on how to develop active, active listening skills? Um, apart from the ones that I mentioned, I don't really have any others. I, I do think that it's important to set some time aside. It, some teachers might go into a, a listening lesson and just immediately get into listening, whereas I think there is a benefit in getting students to do a sort of listening exercises, uh, warm-up exercises, like the ones I mentioned earlier. So your lesson might start with a lesson, uh, listening that you did from your previous lesson, um, just taking snatches of it and getting them to just listen and repeat and listen and write and so on, or listen and explain, just in short bursts so that they're doing it as a warm-up activity, if you like, before they actually start to, to, um, to listen. It might also help for them to be aware of what helps them. Um, some people prefer to keep writing as they listen. Others, um, you know, need to focus on the, the reading questions and so on. They, they really need to find what's going to help each individual, I think. Thank you. A question now from Olga Benici, but also from a few others, about whether you've got any particular tips for achieving band 8 and even 9, because many of many candidates are aiming for that level, particularly those who are applying for masters. Yeah. yeah, it's most of the questions I get are about how to achieve band 7, and I, I do think that there is, um, people do think it's quite difficult to reach those higher levels. Um, it's, it's really all about developing your English skills and focusing very much on 
what's being measured, so which skills are being measured, um, especially in the writing um, in the writing tasks. I think people are often just not concentrating enough on making sure they have fully answered the question um, and and concentrating on those basic errors. The difference between a band seven and a band eight can be about making sure you're not um, you haven't got slips and so on that are noticeable within your writing. So that level of accuracy is really what we're looking for up at band eight, as well as um, being able to showcase all of the vocabulary that you do have and your, your grammatical structures and so on. Um, we've got time for one more question, but don't worry if your question hasn't been answered, because I'm about to tell you something exciting about uh, an, another opportunity to answer those. But a uh, final question from Christopher Copeland. Um, my, my problem is that my pupils find it very difficult to think of ideas, especially for task two. How do I help them to think outside the box? So is this for writing task two, I'm assuming? I did mention at the very end there, I think reading widely is something you should really encourage your, your students to do. Um, and I did mention that I often recommend through my Twitter and uh, Facebook page, um, I, if I find an article that I think is useful, then I do recommend it. And it's the kind of thing they can then read um, you know, as they're traveling to or from school or work. And, and it, that kind of thing can be very useful within a speaking test. I, I suggest that they practice saying things like, um, well, uh, that's an interesting topic. You know, I read an article which said and so on and so they can refer back to things then that they've um, that they've read because I agree that it having an idea to to talk about is a is a stumbling block for some unless they really practice doing that all of the time and read widely. Hey, thank you very much Pauline that's been absolutely fascinating we have so many questions coming in but I'm afraid that's what we've got time for but don't panic everybody because there's some more webinars coming up for you with Pauline. We're running two special question and answer sessions with Pauline on the IELTS writing paper um, on February the 4th at 4 p.m. UK time and again on the 5th at 9 a.m. so 9 o'clock in the morning. So if you've got a, a questions for Pauline about the, the writing paper do please come along to those webinars. You can sign up via the uh, Cambridge events page which Lucia is going to paste into the, at just this moment, paste into the chat box and don't forget also that next week at the usual time, at 3 o'clock UK time, Ben Goldstein will be talking about discovering video, the role of visual stimulus in the secondary classroom. And then the week after that, on the 10th, Lynn Durrant will join us for a talk on creating a stimulating classroom for very young learners. And you can sign up for all of those webinars on our events page. So thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Thank you particularly, Pauline, for being absolutely fascinating. Lots of answers and lots of It's my pleasure. <laughs> see you again next week. Yes. Thanks, Alistair. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody.